And the household of Imran consisted of Imran, his wife Hannah, his daughter Maria, and then also Isa alayhi salam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he expresses their divine approval with the verses, subhanAllah, that the Imam just recited in the Salah. Now I promise you I have not spoken to the Imam. And I promise you that the Imam he has not spoken to me. <laughs> right? Inna Allah asqafa Adam wa Nuha wa ala Ibrahim wa ala Imran ala al-alameen. As he's reciting, I'm getting chills, subhanAllah. Right? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he selected Nuh alayhi salam and he selected, uh, Afwan, he selected Adam alayhi salam and Nuh and the household of Ibrahim and the household of Imran over the entire world, right? And this means that certain virtues and uh, distinct blessings were bestowed upon these people and their households to the exception of others, right? And also this blessing is in lineage and also nubuwa, prophethood. That Adam salam, he was the first human being and also the first prophet, the father of all of mankind. And then Nuh salam, he was the first messenger and the new dispensation of messengers and prophets would come through his lineage. Right? And then Ibrahim is the father of the Anbiya, the father of the prophets. Right? And the end of that lineage on the side of Ishaq is with Ali Imran, Isa being the last and the seal of the prophets sent to Bani Israel. And that's why it's significant that he had not a father and he had not any son, right? Because he is the seal of prophethood sent to Bani Israel. And on the other side, from Ibrahim alayhi salam, son Ismail, then we have the prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu was salam, right? But the reference point here is that Allah is expressing his divine approval to these different households, specifically here the household of Imran. And then you have the household of Zakariya alayhi salam, and I mentioned that they were connected by way of lineage, right? That the household of Zakariya traces its origins back to Dawood alayhi salam, and so too did the household of Imran, right? And then they were connected through marriage as Zakariya alayhi salam is said to have married the sister, or the aunt rather, of Maryam, the sister of Hannah, the mother of Maryam. And then from that marriage, Yahya alayhi salam, he was born, making him the maternal cousin of Isa alayhi salam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says about this household, إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا يُسَارِعُونَ فِي الْخَيْرَاتِ وَيَدْعُونَنَا رَغَبًا وَرَهَبًا وَكَانُوا لَنَا خَاشِعِينَ Right, very, very beautiful characteristics that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about this particular household. And this for us is the first quality of virtuous households, which is our topic for today, right? A virtuous culture inside of the home, right? Virtuous households have a virtuous culture that starts inside of the home. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes their culture in their home saying that they used to race, they used to compete in khairat, in doing good deeds, right? And they used to call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in hope and in fear. 
than they were before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala awestruck. They had this sense of respect and reverence for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And each of these phrases is a dimension of insight in and of itself. Right? To compete and race in doing good inside of your home as a culture. Can you imagine this type of culture? Right? Someone who is racing is not only trying to be first to do the, the good deed, looking for the opportunity when it comes, right? But they're also trying to be best, right? It's not just get it over with, but be the first to do it and do it in the best way, right? And naturally, somebody who is racing to do something, they, they are anticipating, they are ready. They are looking and they're waiting for an opportunity to do good. You don't have to tell them to do the dishes. You don't have to tell them to clean up the room, do your homework, take out the trash, right? The husband doesn't have to ask for his rights, nor does the wife have to ask for her rights. Everybody is looking for that opportunity to do good, right? So you can imagine the environment inside of the home when everybody is trying to do good and competing, right? And naturally, this would encourage Right? Everyone else to do more good. I can't let so-and-so beat me. Right? And we saw this also in our companions. They used to compete to be first. Right? We know that Omar, Allah Ta'ala, and Abu Bakr, they always used to compete. Right? And, and Omar, he would just want to, you know, one time. <laughs> let me win one time. Right? Competing with one another and doing good. Right? So this is the culture inside of their home. And then, and they used to call upon Allah in hope and in fear. And oftentimes, when we think about this characteristic, calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in hope and in fear, automatically, the meaning that comes into our mind is that it is out of fear of Allah that we're calling upon Him. And it is out of hope in Allah that we're calling upon Him. And this is certainly a valid meaning, right, that we should call upon Allah because we fear Him, and we should call upon Allah because we hope in Him. This is a valid meaning, but this is not the entire comprehensive meaning, right? This would also include our worldly fears, our worldly concerns, as well as our worldly hopes, right, and our worldly ambitions and our dreams. Right? And this is why Zechariah said, Wa inni khiftul min warai. Right? That I fear, this has many translations as we'll discuss, right? For my dependents is one of the translations, or for those who will be in charge after me. Right? He's not expressing his fear of Allah, but in fact, he's expressing a worldly fear. Right? So when we talk about calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in fear and in hope, this also includes our worldly ambitions and concerns. Our concerns over our children. Where's the first place that we turn when we have that, that concern for our children? We turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Or we, we hope for them good, that they'll have good friends, that they'll have a good environment that they'll have a good life and a good end, and of course, a good hereafter. Where's the first place that we turn to express those hopes? We turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right, so this means that they were in constant communication with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this for us as parents is something that we have to actively instill in our children. That when they come to us, like Yusuf came to his father, alayhi wassalam, with their dreams, with their visions, with their ambitions, we have to turn their hearts to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Just as his father said that Allah is going to bless you just like he, but he turned his heart towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And we find this in the sunnah of the Prophet alayhi salatu wassalam. This was also from his tarbiya that he would turn the hearts of the young people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So one time he was, uh, uh, Ibn Abbas reports this narration, he says, Ya Ghulam, O young boy, 
Right, this is a very extended narration, but from it he said, Wa ida sa'alta fas'alillah. That whenever you ask, then you should ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you have hopes, when you have dreams, when you have concerns, when you have fears, wa ida sa'alta fas'alillah. Right? Then you should turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that situation. Wa ida sta'alta fas'alim billah. And when you seek assistance, then you should seek assistance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <laughs> right? And then the last characteristic, <laughs> that this household, from their virtue, is that they were all struck by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They had a sense of reverence and awe and respect for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this characteristic, khushur, this is something that we associate mainly with what? Salah. But I ask you, if you don't have khushur, reverence, and awe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your regular day-to-day -day life, do you think you're going to show up to the salah and turn on the switch of khushur and have khushur in your salah? <coughs> right? Khushur is not an, something that is limited to the prayer. This state of awe and reverence and and and. and uh, respect of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is something that should encompass our entire lives. Right? And unfortunately in our times we have certain habits and characteristics that would work against the development of our khushur. This quality of awe and reverence. One thing is using the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in vain. Right? This is especially prevalent in Eastern cultures. Um, I'm not sure how it is in uh, the Desi community, right? But in the Arab community, we find that the youth are using the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without the, the necessary ta'aleem that they should have of the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, using it to swear in vain, using it very, very casually, swearing over things that aren't really you know, befitting of the majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, i.e. video games, i.e. you know, what's happening in the entertainment. And these are not conversations where we should be using the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while swearing. That makes sense? Right? And so these subtle things actually reduce the, the level of awe and reverence in our hearts, whether consciously or subconsciously, by using the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in vain, right? So we want to be mindful in our speech that we maintain the proper reverence of the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at all times, right? Respecting the Quran and all of these type of things, this will create that sense of awe and reverence and respect inside the household, right? And vice versa. Now, every household has its culture, right? Staple qualities and, and customs and traditions that that household, that family, it will be known by, right? Some families, you know, they really focus on akhlaq, right? Character and, and manners. And this is a quality that, that that family would be known by in the community, right? Other families, they are, you know, uh, so into the Quran, you know, three, four, hufad in one household, right? How did that happen? Because there was a culture that was established in the household that would actually promote that, right? Just as we have uh, people who are academics, right? Five doctors <laughs> in one household, right? Because that was the culture that was established in that household, right? And culture has a very, very profound effect on the human being, especially the culture that you inherit at a young age, right? It is something that is very, very hard to break free from. And that can be a good thing if the culture is good in the household, but that can also be a negative thing if the culture is a, a negative culture. Right? Some families, right, they struggle with certain types of vice, you know, backbiting or or slander or israf, extravagance, right? Different types of and sometimes we don't think that the youth are watching or that they are listening, right? 
but they are listening and they are watching and even in their subconscious, they are absorbing all of this information, everything that is happening around them until we see it showing up in their own character, in their own actions, right? And beautiful example from the Quran is the mother of Maryam, Hannah, and Maryam herself. Right? It is no coincidence that we find the mother of Maryam seeking refuge with Allah on behalf of her offspring. Right? She's seeking refuge. This is from her quality with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What happens when the angel Jibril appears to Maryam in the form of a, a, a handsome man? Right? Instantly, she seeks refuge. Right, in the in the A'udhu bil Rahmani minka in kunta taqiyya. Right, immediately she sought refuge with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. She inherited that quality, perhaps from her mother. Likewise, when she is told that she is going to have a child, she says, "How am I going to have a child? Wa lam yamsasni basha. No man has ever touched me. Wa lam aku baqiyya, and I have never been unchaste." Right, fast forward, when she brings the child in front of her people, they say what? The very same quality that Maryam testifies, you know, that she has not been unchaste, now the people are testifying to the chastity of her mother before her. Right? As they say, like parent, like child, like father, like son like daughter, like mother, right? And then on the other side, we have a very beautiful story that I really think encompasses this culture from the family of Zechariah, right? That one day, Yahya alayhi salam, or not one day, actually, three days, he got missing. <coughs> Nobody can find Yahya, this young boy, for three days. So Zechariah, his father, and this is recorded in Ibn Kathir's Qisas uh, and Nabi'in, the stories of the prophets, right? Zechariah is now worried. And he's looking here and there, he's asking, he's searching, right? Three days missing, where is my son? What has happened to my son? Right? Until he finally finds him inside of a hole, like a grave that he had dug for himself, right? And Zechariah he is astonished. <laughs> he is baffled. What, you know, how is he going to process this? And so he says, Oh my son, I have been searching for you three for three days, and here I find you inside of this grave that you have dug for yourself. Right? And obviously he's inquiring, like, what's going on? Are you okay? Is everything all right? What happened? Right? And then Yahya alayhi salam, he responds, saying, Oh, my father, did you not say? Right? We don't think they're listening. We don't know how they're going to interpret the information that we're actually passing on to them. Did you not say that between paradise and the hellfire is a bridge that can only be crossed by the tears of those who weep? It was from that lesson that perhaps his father didn't even realize the profundity of that lesson that he was teaching his son that led Yahya to this place trying to stimulate the necessary characteristic that would attain him the paradise. Right? They used to compete in race in doing good. And they used to call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in hope and in fear. And they were awestruck by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Zakariyah alayhi salam, he tells his son, once he hears why, his reason, he tells him to continue to weep. And he doesn't stop there. He gets down inside with him and he cries alongside of his son. Right? This is the type of virtuous culture that is extinct in our time. <laughs> right? And I'm not asking anybody to go dig any graves, right? 
but to take the lesson, right? To build, actively build that culture of righteousness in your home, right? What time should I end, inshallah? We have a lot of time. We have a lot of time. Okay, I have to leave at 7.30. That's the hat. That's the end. The perfect. Perfect, inshallah. Okay. Now, this culture, as I mentioned, it is a generational culture, passed down from generation to generation to generation. It didn't start with the mother of Maryam, nor did it start with the father of Yahya, Rather, it goes back even to Dawood, Remember I said in the beginning that both of these households, they trace their lineage back to Dawood, Right? And Dawood, as we know, he was known for his devotion. He was known for his prayer and his fasting. And the Prophet والسلام, he testified to this when he said, I have salati ila Allah, salatu Dawood. That the most beloved prayer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was the prayer of Dawood. And the most beloved fasting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was the fasting of Dawood alayhi salam. Of course, this doesn't include the Prophet Right? But he's testifying to the devotion of Dawood alayhi salam. And just as we find Dawood alayhi salam giving preference and precedence to a place called the Mihrab, the Mihrab is a place of spiritual retreat, a place carved out for devotion. In that time, it was like a chamber, right? A special chamber, not like the Mihrab that we have now, which is a niche in the wall. But then it was a chamber, a room for private devotion, right? Just as we find Dawood, alayhi salam, giving precedence to that space, we also find his son, Sulaiman, alayhi salam, doing the very same thing. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says about Dawood, وَهَلْ أَتَاكَ النَّبَأُ الْخَصْمِ إِذْ تَسَوَّرُوا الْمِحْرَابِ إِذْ دَخَلُوا عَلَى دَاوُودَ فَفَزِعَ مِنْهُ Right. Did you hear the account of the disputants when they climbed over into the mihrab until they entered upon Dawood alayhi salam and he became startled at their presence? Why do you think they went looking in the mihrab? Because this was a place that Dawood alayhi salam was known to frequent. They knew that they would find him there. And then regarding Sulaiman alayhi salam, in terms of the things that the jinn used to build for him, Allah says, يَعْمَلُونَ لَهُ مَا يَشَاءُ مِمْ مَحَارِيبَ And this is the plural for mihrab, that the first thing that Allah mentions that he used to build, and this shows priority and preference, is the mihrab. And the only other people mentioned in relation to the mihrab in the Quran is Zakaria alayhi salam and Maryam. Right? As the Imam, he recited those verses. Uh, Every time that Zakaria salam, would enter upon Maryam in the mihrab, he would find with her different types of provision. Right? And this brings us to now the second quality of virtuous household. What was the first quality? Who can remind me? From our youth. Huh? That was encompassed in one expression, a virtuous culture. Who said it? MashaAllah. Right? Virtuous culture, including what you said, that entire verse, inside of the household. Now, the second quality is that virtuous culture is now spilling out into the society. And the foremost place that it is reaching in terms of benefits is the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Dawood alayhi salam, Sulaiman alayhi salam, all in the service of the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, the concern of the mother of Maryam for the service of Allah's house was so deep that even before the child was born, she said, Rabbi inni nadartu laka ma fi batani muharrara. 
She had already dedicated the child to the service of the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not knowing, subhanAllah, look how deep her concern was. She failed to consider whether the child would be a male or female. said unta, and the male is not like the female. Right? And in that time it was customary only for the males to be dedicated to the service of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in this case, Allah made a special concession for Maryam, and they gave her the mihrab, a special chamber for her devotion, right inside of the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Deep concern for the service of Allah. And it is the same concern that led Zakariya alayhi salam to plead with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a male offspring. Right? Because as I translated earlier, he said, Right? He said that I am afraid of those who will be, or for those who will be in charge after me, or those who will be uh, over my dependents. Right? And he wanted someone to take charge of the religious affairs. Right? And so the very same concern in the mother of Maryam, we find it in the father of Yahya, alayhi salam. Right? And what's unique and what's virtuous about this is that most people have the mindset that what can the house of Allah do for me and my family? This is the mindset of the majority, in my humble opinion. Right? But the greater virtue is not what can the house of Allah do for me and my family. The higher virtue is what can me and my family do for the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is divinely approving of their virtue and directing us towards it in his book. Right? Now, obviously, today we're not dedicating our children to the service of the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this capacity, right? But we should still make sure that they are in the service of the house of Allah, right? A high school senior should have on his application, if he wants to be competitive, at least 120 to 160 volunteer hours, service hours. Why can't he spend half of those? in the service of the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? We have 501c3 status, we have nonprofit status, we can actually write volunteer hours for our youth, planning programs, helping out at events, and so forth and so on, right? In the spirit of that family, culture, that virtue, like uh, the likes of Zechariah and the household of Imran. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he puts forth a very profound comparison between these two households. And he makes a contrast between Zechariah and Hen. So in Zechariah, we have an elderly man. And in Hannah, we have an elderly woman. And Zechariah, this elderly man, he is given a son. Well, Hannah, this elderly woman, she is given a daughter. And Zechariah's dua is actually before conception and pregnancy, right, because his wife was barren. While the dua of Hannah is actually after she conceived and after she gave birth. And Hannah she names her child, wa inni made to her Maryam. She is the one who named the child. Whereas in the case of Yahya salam, it was not his father who named him, but it was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who named the child. Ya Zakariya inna nubashiruka bi ghulam in ismuhu Yahya. Right? Oh, Zachariah, we give you the glad tidings of a child. His name is Yahya. We did not give anyone this name before. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unfolds, you know, a very, very impeccable linguistic display. And what's profound about this is that this is not the uh, 
authorship of a fictional author, where you can just manipulate the outcome, you can say this and you can say that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he authored this with the lives of real individuals. This is how he authored their actual lives. Right? And there's many dynamic benefits that we can actually take from what we call this dynamic eloquence. Right? The Quran is dynamic eloquence as opposed to stagnant eloquence. Stagnant eloquence is something that produces awe right, and reverence, wow, right? but no actual action that follows. Right? Whereas dynamic eloquence produces awe and reverence as well as you know, rectification and refinement. And so one of the dynamic benefits of this type of eloquence is that it shows us and demonstrates the range of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's ability. That no matter if you are an elderly woman or an elderly man or even a youth who has never even been touched by a man, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is over all things capable. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is the source of life, right? Young, old, male, female, prophet, not a prophet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he can make amazing things happen for you, right? Whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he commands something, then he only has to say be, and it becomes be, and it is. Right? But we should know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he does for people of virtue what he does not do for people of vice. Right? He does for people of virtue what he does not do for people of vice. Right? Now, and perhaps I'll close on this point, inshallah. Despite this amazing contrast, they both desire to have male children. Yes or no? Right? They're both anticipating male children, right? And generally speaking, people have different intentions and reasons for wanting male children, right? Uh, to carry on the family name in terms of lineage, right? This is why some of the uh, polytheists, the Mushrik King, they used to criticize the Prophet ﷺ because he, all of his male offspring uh, passed away before him. Right? And they used to criticize them before that. So some people, they want to have their lineage and their name. Others for the family business. Who's going to take over the family business? Others solely for the purpose of boasting. As the man in Surah Kaf, we know he was boasting about how much wealth he had and how many children he had. And man, well, banum. Right? However, in terms of virtue, this is not the intention of the mother of Hannah, nor is it the intention of the father of Afwan, the mother of Maryam and the father of Yahya. Rather, they have the most praiseworthy intentions, right? And that is so that these male children, if they are blessed with them, they would be in the service of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they would contribute to the perpetuation of Allah's deen and the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Right? In the earth. Right? And subhanAllah, most supplications that we make, maybe, you know, I'm only speaking for myself in this regard, right? But most of the time, we're asking to receive something from Allah. Yes or no? Right? Oh Allah, give me this. Oh Allah, grant me this. Right? We're asking Allah to receive something from Him. However, if you look at the supplication of the, of the mother of Maryam salam, she's not asking to receive something from Allah, right? But she's asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to receive something from her, right? And she said, فَتَقَبَّلْ minni." So receive this, so accept this from me, right? And so this is a supplication of the highest degree. <laughs> not asking, but actually offering. Knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you could never truly repay him, but at least allow me an opportunity ex to express my gratitude and to do something, you know, that would be acceptable in your eyes, Ya Rabb, right? This is the expression, and this is the highest caliber of supplication. And I won't have time to close entirely, but I'll mention two powerful du'as. And these are two, in my opinion, of the most amazing supplications in the world. 
right? We have the supplication of Hannah. Perhaps it's all we get through. And then we have the supplication of Zechariah, which is really a model, a model for getting your supplications answered. But I don't think we'll have time for that. Let's start with the supplication of the mother of Mary, right? And how powerful are these supplications that from these du'a, think about this, prophets, a messenger because of du'a, right? Miracles, a genuine woman of perfection, right? Revelation was sent down as a result of the supplication that we're talking about, these supplications, right? Powerful, powerful supplications. And by the way, there is a type of momentum behind these supplications because they lived a life of righteousness. It's not just anyone coming and asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a miracle, but that supplication is being carried forth by years and years of righteousness, right? And the dua of Hannah was so powerful that it kept away the shaitan from her offspring for two generations. Kept away the shaitan from her offspring for two generations. Hey, what's a generation? He wants to act so bad, right? <laughs> right? Your grandfather is a generation, your father is a generation, and you're the third generation, okay? Like that, right? So she said, Why in the do have have a shaitan of Rajin? I seek refuge with you, O Allah, on behalf of my daughter, Maryam, and on behalf of her offspring. Right? Min shaytan al-rajim. What is the secret to this supplication? Why was the shaytan kept away from her for two generations? Huh? Anybody know? Anybody want to take a stab? Huh? So one of the secrets, right? is that she mentions the word Rajin. And Rajin is one of the attributes of Shaitan that actually invokes distance, right? So the word Rajama means to be cast away by stones, right? To be cast away by stones. So she is invoking distance, right? So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he cast out the Shaitan from the heavenly realm, Right? Get away from here. Distance, right? Get out from here. Because you are outcast. You are cast away. Right? And even when the pilgrims, they go to make hajj and they do the jamarat, they cast stones at the jamarat. And this is symbolic of casting away the shayateen. Just as Ibrahim alayhi salam, he did before. Right? And then you have the shayateen, they try to eavesdrop at the lower heavens. Try to eardrop and steal information that's being revealed, discussions from the angels, what's going to happen, and then they use that information to deceive the people. 